very good evening ladies and gentlemen warm welcome to each one of you on yoga panel pancho kaise as you of icr for a very unique <coughs> program today it's a half day seminar on global opportunities for indian chartered accountants in uk i hope this program will benefit all the chartered accountants who are looking forward for opportunities for working in uk and to just brief about the program we are having with us ca vandana saxena korea mr arun narayan and ca meena s rao to give us a detailed presentation on today's subject we have split the today's seminar into two sessions first session will be having introduction to icaw and work with icai and will be having discussion on outlining the key areas of the uk economy including the specialist sectors that the uk has strengthened and where icai members can benefit from this we are also going to talk about the opportunities of working with uk including the visas that are available and the conditions that are applicable and also outlining how icaw supports members to develop business and career both in the uk and internationally in the second session we are going to talk about the journey from icai to icaw and show icai members how they can build links to uk companies in order practices for future benefits also give icai members an opportunity to meet icaw members first time and also ask them any queries and last we will be having a question and answer sessions so i request banner branch chairman shravan guru to kindly escort all the three speakers of today on to the dais I request them to kindly welcome our speakers who are present in the floor. Okay. Big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. OBFCA is an award-winning serial entrepreneur who specializes in strategically and operationally building bridges within the companies, individuals, and other stakeholders. A former IFRS expert and business strategist, she has worked across the UK, Europe, and India over the last 22 years. A chartered accountant by profession, she has founded and run multiple companies with her first one sold to then listed company PTT Professional Education. She went on to found and run their international division for seven years before founding a professional skills training company. Now she is reaching by ICAW to assist with strategy and thought leadership in India. She is the director for the UK India Business Council and was awarded the equivalent of Padma Shri from the Queen of England with this great recognition. To briefly introduce about Mr. Arun Narayan, is associated with two organizations at present. While he is part of management and board of Vive Workshop, one of India's oldest co-working space uh, providers, he is also a consultant with the UK in India Business Council. He has been associated with UK IBC since 2014 and has been helping grow bilateral trade between UK and India. He currently works in projects fund, funded by both the Indian and the UK governments, connecting British companies to potential opportunities in India. Prior to UK IBC, he was with the Irish government's trade body, IDA Ireland. Mr. Arun comes with a mix of private sector and government or semi-government experience across industries and is growing bilateral and trade between India, Ireland, and UK. He has worked across industries like FMCG, telecom, and BFSI, and companies like Coca-Cola, Bharti Airtel, and American Express, respectively. Mr. Arun is also actively, eagerly stage investor and advisor to companies across sectors, and is involved specifically in business growth, financial planning, fundraising with these companies. He holds a degree in commerce and from Bangalore University, and an EPBM from Indian Institute of Management, Calcutta. He is also a trained six sigma practitioner. With this brief introduction, I welcome you for today's seminar. 
to briefly introduce our CEO Meena Esra. She is a chartered accountant from ICA and ICAW and an MBA, having more than 12 years of experience in the field of audit and assurance. She is currently working as a senior member with Deloitte Hastings and Stills LLP and previously worked with Deloitte UK. She handles audit of large multinationals. FTAC 500 entities, listed entities in India involving IFRS, UK GAAP and Indian AS, especially in the consumer product, automotive, manufacturing and technology sectors and she is also involved in facilitating various technical training programs. She is also co-authored many books and ICF guidance note on audit of IF, IF co FR. With this brief introduction, I welcome you to today's seminar. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Okay, so thank you very much for the introductions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for inviting us all to come and speak. Uh, we appreciate you all coming today. Thank you. So I've, um, uh, I've already had this wonderful introduction uh, by one of your committee members, so thank you very much for that. So I'll, I'll move on. Uh, before we get started in the opportunities actually in the UK, I thought it would make sense to go a bit broader. I think our profession is facing a number of challenges at the moment, um, and there's a number of new age industries that are likely to turn our industry on its head. And so the first thing that I want to do is just talk very briefly about the future trends in the accountancy and the finance profession. Because I think for all of us, if you're planning on working for more than the next five years, and looking around the room, most of you will be, um, there are some, some significant changes that are going to impact the way we work. And the more we're aware of them now, the better we can be prepared for the future. So then I'm going to talk briefly about the Institute of Chartered Accountants, England and Wales. Who are we? Obviously you know what chartered accountants do. Um, but what we do varies from country to country, and the emphasis on what we do also varies from country to country. So then we're going to talk about opportunities in the UK and opportunities with the UK. So one being if you're physically located in the UK, and the other being if we look around the UK. Um, <clears throat> post that, I'm going to talk a little bit about why ICAW membership will be useful. Um, and then I'll take a few questions. But actually, before I take the questions, I'll hand over to Arun, who is going to give you a much broader idea of what's happening in the UK. So that will be part of this presentation. And then afterwards, I can talk about why I feel it's a good idea to be an ICAW member. But we have somebody here who's actually been through the hard graft of becoming and has been for a few years. And Mina's going to talk about what it's been like for her and the change in her knowledge, the change in the opportunities, and she's going to talk to you about some of the other people who did the exams and also are now ICAWs. <coughs> We're going to follow that with questions and answers, but this is not a formal presentation to you, so at any point if you've got any questions, I think any of us will be happy to answer. Is that okay? Yeah. Yep? Okay. So let's start with the future trends in our profession. Excuse me. <clears throat> okay, the, I think the number one thing we have to think about are the huge changes that are happening in technology. There have been a number of surveys that have been done, there have been a number of reports that have been done. Recently there was a Deloitte report which said that automation is going to take out 50%, that's 5-0 percent of accounting jobs. Right? That's a large number. So those of you who are in practice, it means that you're probably going to be recruiting less and less junior people to actually be doing the audits. Those of you who are in industry, it means that you're going to be recruiting far less people to actually join because most of those jobs at the basic level are going to be automated. <coughs> A lot of people are talking about blockchain. Um, blockchain being used in many different fields. 
Blockchain essentially, essentially is an accounting and auditing technology. The reason being is if blockchain is used correctly, it's going to help auditors verify ownership, existence, and possibly valuation. So as an auditor, those of you who are practicing, you are going to need to understand blockchain really well, and you're going to need to know how to audit blockchain, which means that you're going to need teams who actually understand the coding behind blockchain just as much as you're going to need people who understand the broad, broader idea of blockchain. Those of you who are in um, industry, you're going to need to be thinking about the implications of blockchain, both in your accounting departments and in your businesses overall. So those are just two examples, you know, things like, things like blockchain, things like um, uh, robotics and automation. Those are two areas that are going to change. But I think it's also worth remembering that when computers came in, there was a huge fear in the accountancy profession that computers were going to just take over and we wouldn't need human beings anymore. All it meant is that our knowledge had to change, and that's all that it's going to mean this time. But it's also going to mean that our clients are not just going to want audits done, but they're going to want more value-added information from the auditors on how they can help make businesses more efficient and streamline things more. Huge changes coming and have come in globalization. If we think about 20 years ago, how many of our Indian companies were overseas and how many of them are now overseas, very, very different picture. How many multinationals are now in India versus 20 years ago, again, different picture. So globalization is changing things. It means if you're an auditor and you're auditing even a medium-sized firm these days, the chances are you might be working with another auditor in another country. And now, especially because of some of the accounting scandals that have happened, it's more important than ever that whether it's your own firm or it's another firm that you're working with, the whole auditing is completely seamlessly delivered. If you're in industry, it means that your reporting needs to be following Indian accounting, but may also need to follow other forms of accounting. And are you up to date on both those different types of accountancy? INDAS is INDAS, IFRS is IFRS. There are some differences between the two. Are you aware of those differences? There are some countries that don't have IFRS implemented. How do you work with those countries? How do you ensure that your knowledge is up to date? If you don't have the knowledge, how do you reach out to other people who do have that knowledge? There are many different types of reporting. We're not just talking about financial reporting. Um, I was with Bartha Sarthi, V.S. Bartha Sarthi, who's the CFO, group CFO of the Mahindra Group, and he very proudly recently showed me their integrated reporting. So Mahindra's are now, they've, they've agreed that they are now annually going to report integrated reporting. Integrated, in, integrated reporting is looking at, obviously, financial reporting, but it's also looking at, so as well as looking at financial capital, it's looking at social capital, environmental capital, manufacturing capital, etc., etc., and how they flow together. Now, I was also in the UK with Shamlala Graval, who is the Auditing and Accounting Standards Board Chief here in India, and he was saying to the UK, um, ICAW, he was saying to them, in the future, our auditors are not only going to be auditing financial information, they may have to give an opinion on environmental information. They may have to give an, um, an opinion on human capital. How do we train up our auditors to be able to deliver on this, or are other experts going to be allowed in? So there was a great discussion about this. Um, two weeks ago, the president and the vice president of ICAI were in London with ICAW looking at different opportunities of collaborating together. So doing some reports on digital, the digital space in finance and accounting, etc. etc. So as as accountants, if we are intent on staying in our profession, these are all areas we're going to have to become used to. <clears throat> Increases in cross-border work, so work between different countries, digital accounting, all these areas we've talked about. AI, will this take over even more jobs in the future? We don't know, we're waiting to see. And there's some really interesting work that's being done by TCS and Genpact on this piece 
in finance and accounting. So this is the future robots. Will we, will we be getting, you know, will we be asking auditing information from robots in the future? They seem to think yes. So let's wait and see. So the only thing we're sure of, um, there's a saying in English, there's nothing in life that's certain apart from, do you know the? Death and taxes. Those are the only two things that are certain in life. Um, and the other constant in life is change. So it's nothing to be frightened of because accountants have faced change since the, since the very beginning of accountancy. Every, every decade there's been changes. We dealt with the Industrial Revolution. We dealt with the first IT revolution and we will deal with the rest of the revolutions. All it means is that we need to be up to date on our knowledge. That's it. But I thought it was worth just reminding us of that. So we did a survey in the UK of our members. So when I say in the UK, it was run out of the Institute, which is based in London. But our members, um, I think it's 40% of our members are overseas in about 130 countries. And we reached out to our members across the globe and we said, what do you want from your chartered accountants? The people in your firm who are chartered accountants, whether in practice or in industry, what do you want from them? And this is what they said. The first thing they said is we want tech savvy thinkers. We want people who understand technology. Um, I was with a, a CFO last week of one of the largest multinationals in India and she told me that her project for the year for her finance team is to make sure no Excel is used. How many of you use Excel? How many of you use it every day? Can you imagine what her team, I mean her team's face dropped. They said, what do you mean no Excel? And she said, you know what, we employ SAP. It is the biggest system in the world and it should be able to do everything. And then they put their hands up and they said, but madam, it doesn't do this, this and this. And she said, really, I want you to give me a list of everything it doesn't do. So she's now got that list. She phoned up SAP. She said, I want you to come in November for a meeting with my staff. They are going to explain to you everything they're doing on Excel. They're going to explain exactly what they download into Excel and the changes. And I want you to create business information tools. We'll pay you for it, but I want you to cre create the business information tools within SAP to do this. And anything that can't be put in as a business information tool, I want made into a macro. But I want to get reporting down from nine days to three days. Now when she gives her team a deadline like, I want to get reporting down from nine days to three days, they kind of look at her and say, yes, we'll look at how we can do it. But when she says no Excel, it changes their thought process. So you have to become technically savvy if you want to go for a no Excel approach. You have to understand how SAP works. You have to understand what you're going to talk to the tech guys about, how these business information tools are going to be created, where the data is coming from, how the data is cleaned, how you make sure that data is correct at the end of the day. These are the things that chartered accountants across the world are expecting in their junior staff. Right? Okay, the other thing they said is compliance is easy. We have software that does compliance. We want chartered accountants who can make judgments. We want them who can go beyond compliance and, and really say, you know, ethical situations or other judgments, whether it comes to provisions, qualitative statements. That's what we want them to be able to do. We want them to be flexible. We want them to be working with IT one day. We want them to be working with people the next day. We want them to be true business partners to the rest of the business. So Unilever, Glaxo, uh, Vodafone, three large companies, um, their finance teams are now called finance business partners. And they're called trusted advisors within the company. So they, they came and they said specifically, we don't want people who can just crunch numbers. We want people who can sit down and say, I'm a part of the same organization. I trust you, you trust me, I am going to make your business much more profitable. That's what they're looking for. Um, another thing that came up a lot from the audit firms is we need people who are internationally minded, 
people who understand global issues and the impact of them, people who can spot trends that are happening in America and bring them here, people who can spot trends that are happening in Africa and bring them here. So those kinds of things. They have to be strong communicators. If they don't have the knowledge, they have to be able to network with other people. Um, I think Mina will be sharing some stories, but one of my favorite stories is, I, I spend a lot of time, one of my mentors is a guy called Ishaq Hussain. Ishaq was the finance director of the Tata Group. He, he was the finance director of Tata Sons. Before that, he was the CFO of Tata Steel. And um, I often said to him, Ishaq, you know, the Tata Group does, you know, it's sort of software, it does everything. How do you get your head around all your products? And he said, the honest answer is I don't. I have other people who can do that. I have to make global decisions, but I don't expect that I should know everything, but I expect to have people in my team, and I need to be able to ask them the right questions. So you need to network to find those right people within the organization who can give you those answers. And the final area that they said that they need their CAs to be is, is people who understand other forms of capital. I talked about integrated reporting. So it's not just about the financial numbers anymore. It's about manufacturing capital, environmental capital, and social capital. And the chartered accountant said, I want people in my team that aren't just numbers driven, understand that profit in the modern day also has a conscience. So that's a, a tough ask for all of us, right? But that's where the world is going. And the reason why I'm telling you all of this is because if you're thinking about working with the UK or in the UK, this is the mindset that you need to have. You need to be thinking much, much more broadly than tax compliance, audit compliance. You need to be thinking about being a valued business partner to the business. Okay, very briefly, who are we as ICAW? So, ICAW, a world leader of the accountancy and finance profession, 150,000 members um, all over the world, and they work in business, they work um, in industry across the world. And how is ICAW supporting the profession globally? Well, one of the things is they've done a huge investment in IT and IT technology. So they frequently, and when I say frequently, I'm talking about at least once a month, have released maybe six to eight articles on things like big data, on blockchain, on digital analysis, data analysis, automation, robotics, because they want everyone to be up to date. They do case studies. So recently, Johnson & Johnson, Johnson Baby Powder, they decided they wanted to automate their payables. And ICAW covered the journey of how they automated payables, and there's a write-up about it on the website. So it's those kinds of things. So strong IT faculty, and faculties, or robust faculties, or divisions in audit, accounting, and tax. There's a lot of updates, there's a lot of position papers. When a new standard comes out, there's a discussion about it, why things were accepted, why things weren't accepted which I think most institutes do as well. They're also very interested in looking at doing things slightly differently. I don't know if any of you came, uh, Shrubby, when was I here last? It was about six weeks ago. Yeah, was it about that? I did a session called False Assurance where we showed a video and it was like, um, it's like a Bollywood movie and it's on a company and a fraud that's happening in the company. And I stop the video every 10 minutes and I ask the audience, what's going wrong? What could happen if they don't fix it? What's the impact on the business? And it built up the story. And I have to tell you, everyone, I know accountancy isn't, dare I say it, that interesting, but everyone was glued to their seats watching this because they'd done it in such an interesting way. Now you can read about audit and you can read about ethics, but when you see it in a movie form, it's much, much more interesting. So ICAW's come up with a couple of movies and I'm hoping that, um, they're short ones of about 30 to 45 minutes. I'm hoping to do a couple more here in Bangalore over the next year. So it helps on ethics and judgment, that's the kind of thing they do. Um, they're constantly updating the syllabus. So for example, in the syllabus now, we have data analytics. 
which is like analytical review, but on a much, much more detailed basis. So that's already there. And um, the other part of how to support the profession is to have a network. And so ICAWs are connected through the web and through events that happen across the world to keep the community together. Okay, um, I will move on from this and I will skip this bit. Actually, I think this is quite an interesting statistic. 95% um, of the FTSE, the FTSE are the top 100 companies listed on the UK Stock Exchange. They're not British companies, they are just the top 100 companies listed on the UK Stock Exchange, and 95% of them have one ICAW member on their board. So that's quite a high statistic. And 55% of the FTSE have um, a COO or a CO, CEO who is a chartered accountant. So more than half of those companies that are listed on the stock exchange have a chartered accountant as, um, as their CEO or COO. And this happened, and you know, in the financial crisis in 2008, that figure of 55 went up to 85%. Because at that time, what they wanted was people who understood cash and how to keep the business going. So, you know, chartered accountants are considered, you know, the most trusted partner when it comes to anything to do with finance. So, let's talk about ICAEW and ICAI. They share many attributes. Um, all the standards are the same, you know, the ethics, the compliance, the integrity, they're all high. And we also support um, our members with training and development, <coughs> membership growth, working with government and regulators, position papers, etc, etc. So we're very, very similar. I guess the only difference is because ICAW has been around since the 1800s, they've worked internationally for a lot longer, and so they have this great credible reputation, and they're in over 160 countries, and then uh, Mina will be telling you a little bit more about how well accepted they are. So with this, giving you a background of ICAW, I'm going to hand over to Arun, who's going to talk a little bit about the opportunities in the UK, so the main industries that exist in the UK, then I'll come back to talk a little bit about how you can work in the UK. So, Arun. Good evening. Um, Shravan and Mangana, thank you very much for calling me over. Thank you all for, for taking some time out today. Uh, we'll try and make it worth your while, hopefully. Uh, before I start, I uh, just want to do a quick audience check. Uh, how many people in the audience actually uh, run your own practice or a partner in, in your own practice? And the rest, I'm assuming, are working uh, in, in the finance function at, at some <coughs> So, <coughs> these are actually some slides that I cannot take any credit for uh, because Vandana has actually put them together. Um, so, thank you very much. So, uh, this just gives you some numbers of, um, you know, what the UK holds as, as an economy. Um, it's, it's one of the easiest uh, markets to do business in because it's very very easy to set up a company there to, to get anything done uh, you know um, on, on the company front uh, everything is very clean very above board so it, so it just you know it's very very seamless unlike what what happens in India um, the the plan is to move corporate tax there to about 17 percent it used to be close to 27 percent uh, about four or five years back, the government uh, took a stance that they will progressively reduce uh, the, the corporate tax in the UK, essentially because they wanted to bring in more compliance and bring in more establishments to set up in the UK, because uh, the feedback that they got in general was that corporate tax was a deterrent. So that is why the progressive roadmap to bring it down to 17%. Uh, you also see uh, on the bottom right corner, there's something which says 10% tax on patents. So that is actually a, a, a project or a program called the Patent Box, which was launched uh, in the UK some time back. 
the objective of that was to encourage companies to develop and innovate in the UK. So you develop your uh, product uh, in the UK, how's your IP in the UK, and uh, when you monetize that IP, you license it out or whatever, then you pay only a 10% tax on it. So these are the few you know, things that the UK has been doing uh, by itself to kind of grow uh, you know, the economy. <coughs> This gives you a little bit of a uh, breakup of the uh, startups in the UK, uh, which kind of sector they are they're focusing on. I see technology we all know now is, is a kind of common thread that runs around all industries. But within that, uh, you know, which are the kind of sub-industries or, or parallel industries that these technologies support. And the map on the, on the left side also gives you a concentration of you know, where these uh, companies are. So, if you look at it, you know, London obviously is is a, is a fairly large chunk of where all the startups in the UK are. But uh, increasingly now, as you start going towards the north of UK, there is a proliferation of uh, the startup economy happening there as well. <coughs> this is uh, this is a glimpse of the of the opportunity. Um, I will take you through in a lot more detail, uh, also in terms of steps that you can possibly take to kind of tap into those opportunity, and uh, we can put, we can possibly share these slides with you as well, so you can you know go through them. We, we don't need to spend time here. Uh, and this, uh, we go, uh, she's also been kind enough to put together stats on specific industries, because uh, we're guessing you know a lot of you all here in this audience might be. Um, you know, proficient or, or better suited or feel more comfortable industry specific. Uh, a large part of your portfolio might be of a certain industry of things. So that's also one of the reasons why uh, you know we've got an industry uh, uh, segregation. This is BFSI, which gives you you know some some numbers. UK, as you all know, is one of the largest financial services markets in the globe. Uh, London obviously being a financial services hub. Uh, it's also one of the oldest uh, with, with a lot of the old insurance and banking companies, Lloyds or HSBC or Standard Chartered, um, Royal Bank of uh, Scotland, all of these uh, companies being headquartered in the UK. Now coming to this slide. So I, I pause the presentation here and, and uh, I, I'd rather speak on this part. Uh, I'd like to pick up, uh, you know, from a point that uh, Vandana was making when she was speaking. She spoke about the ICAEW and the ICAI, you know, jointly uh, going out on a trip into India trying to uh, figure out uh, possibilities for, you know, doing things together. Now, very, very similar efforts are also being done at the government-to-government -government level. Uh, the body that I represent, UK India Business Council, we are essentially a British government backed body and uh, our whole purpose of being established and we were set up about close to 10 years back, one of the core areas of our uh, uh, you know, being here is to grow bilateral trade between India and UK. Uh, as part of this, uh, we work on projects that are funded by the UK government, we work on projects that are funded by the Indian High Commission from the UK. Um, but essentially, a lot of all of this work revolves around seeing how we can bring in more UK companies to set up and invest in India as part of the whole Make in India program. Uh, there's a lot of work happening on getting UK companies to come in and pitch into smart cities projects, um, you know, build stuff for smart cities. It could be technology products, it could be hardware, it could be, you know, engineering products, it could be any of these things. Building. Uh, you know, uh, garbage cleaning solutions, it could be water solutions, it could be solutions for uh, laying roads. Uh, so there are a variety of things that UK companies are now getting involved in as far as India is concerned. Um, one of the key objectives of today's session was to see how the people in this room can tap into the opportunities arising from there. Right? So while the Government to government action is happening where you know both the Indian and the UK governments are trying to work together, bring in companies into India. Um, the fact is that all of these companies that are coming in will need support in India. 
because if they are successful in, in a bid and a lot of them are not even waiting to get successful for a bid, they are actually happy to start with an entity here which would be a subsidiary of their UK uh, entity and then have somebody on ground to bid and grow business. It's very unlike what Indians do which is to try and win business and then set up a subsidiary but because of the strength of the currency a lot of the UK companies are happy to come here and put the money in before you know winning business and the putting the money in bit and setting up is where all of you all come into play and uh, that's the point that you know Vandana was trying to allude to which is the expertise required to set up something in India is very different from the knowledge required in the UK. It is both CH but then the laws are different. But what is more appreciated is somebody who can be a hybrid. Somebody who is in India, is qualified in India, understands the laws extremely well, understands you know, the, you know, how the Companies Act works and, and what is okay and what is not okay, exemptions that you get here, um, compliances that you need here and is able to kind of merit that or translate that into the UK law or requirements as well. So somebody who is able to bring a homogeneous solution and that is where this meeting of minds of you know the ICAEW and the ICAI is, is sought. So because if you look at uh, the requirements from companies, they are very very, um, see any new company coming into a new geography, forget whether it's India or you know whichever country, they are a little skeptical about what they are going to see, what they are going to get in that country. So what they look for is, is again something that she was talking about which is a trusted advisor. That trusted advisor tag becomes a lot more trusted if you are also qualified in the UK way of accounting. Because then they are a lot more comfortable that you know their stuff and you know the stuff here. So that, if you ask me, is a huge opportunity. If I were to give you some numbers, um, last count, this was I think possibly about close to 8 months, 1 year back, we had more than 520 or 530 UK companies already established and doing business in India. And these include the large ones like the GSKs, the DRGOs, JCBs, HSBCs, Standard Chartered of the world. But the meat is actually in all the mid-range companies. So at UK IBC, we, we keep getting requests from at least two or three companies every month to explore setup in India. And we, we have a constant flow of companies from the UK coming and setting up in India because they see huge business potential here, they see huge opportunity here, um, especially in the light of Brexit uh, because what Britain is trying to do is to build trade partners for a post Brexit time and India happens to be in the forefront of, of that um, action mainly because of the fact that the um, legal system and all of that, the language is all you know very very similar. The Indian legal system is based very very much on the British system because of the history that we have. Uh, the language obviously English is a, is a, is a very uh, common language in India, there is no problem. So the comfort level for British companies to come to India is a lot more than let's say going to China. So they see India as a natural ally and as a result there is a lot of flow of companies. And their chartered accountants in the UK are constantly looking for partners in India who can help these companies settle down in India and grow in India in a compliant way and in a secure way. So it will help all your businesses to potentially look at partnering with CAs in the UK, you know, if maybe through a membership, maybe through a, you know, through a couple of visits which possibly ICAW can facilitate. Explore how you can make this work because there is a lot of business coming out of it. For those of you who are, uh, who are working, uh, there is a good 30-40% of you all in this audience who, who are in jobs. Um, if you are also exploring, you know, going abroad, 
may not be to relocate, but you know, even on a project for a couple of years or something like that to get exposure to international markets, it's a lot easier to get picked by one of those 520, 30 odd British companies if you have an ICAEW tag. So if they want to do a migration project from the UK to India, if they want to look at some kind of business amalgamation between the two countries, they would much rather prefer somebody that has both tags than somebody that has only one tag, which is, I'm saying, the Indian and the UK CA tag. So these are essentially areas that, that you, know, you would need to um, focus on as far as your business growth or the opportunities are concerned if you want to tap them and, and explore them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop here and um, I'm happy if you want to ask me questions right away or if you want to kind of go through the rest of it and uh, you know we can take questions at the end, that works as well. some of the industries um, that are very, very popular in the UK. And I think he gave you uh, a good understanding of, you know, those of you who are in practice, there is a huge need to have you networking with UK chartered accountancy companies, um, especially the small and medium-sized firms in the UK. They have many clients who could potentially export to India, but maybe uh, have heard some difficult stories and are a bit concerned, they need a trusted advisor over here. Equally, you may have companies over here who could export to the UK, but you're not sure how they could go about doing it. To partner with a small or medium-sized firm in the UK could be a good idea. So that's one of the things we'll discuss. If you actually want to go to the UK and work as a chartered accountant, um, First of all, I won't, I won't talk about in practice, I'll talk about in industry. Um, the first thing I would say is you really need to build up your sector expertise. You will have to be absolutely brilliant, you will have to have all the knowledge of that particular industry. Um, and you'll need to research opportunities in, in your particular industry, so you can read, there's many reports available on the internet from the UK India Business Council, from the Chambers of Commerce, etc. Um, you will need to identify companies because you can't just turn up in the UK and hope to get a job. It doesn't work like that. But I also want to make one thing really clear. At the moment we're still under EU regulations, which means that until April next year, very honestly, it's incredibly difficult to just go to the UK and get a job. Because what you will need to do is you will need to find a company over there that is willing to sponsor you. And if they sponsor you, they first of all have to go through a local test, which means they have to prove to the government that there's nobody locally who's got the same skills as you that could do the job. So that's a major challenge for you at the moment, right? Now, after April next year, things change completely. And there's probably going to be a new, um, a new scheme in place, but it hasn't been announced yet. It's probably going to be something like a highly skilled migrant scheme, in which case it will be much easier. But at this moment in time, my honest advice to you is if you're thinking about, I want to move to the UK and get a job, I would say it's next to impossible. Okay, so I want everyone to be very clear. I don't want you to go out and say, she said there was a 1% chance, I'm saying there's a 0% chance. Obviously, and the reason I say that is because I know a few people who have tried, and uh, they're chartered accountants with amazing banking experience, they've worked for Credit Suisse, they've worked for Deutsche Bank, they really know their subject matter. The problem is there are 10 people in the UK who have that same subject matter. Even when they said, we've got India experience, and they need somebody with India experience, Unfortunately or fortunately, there are over a million Indians in the UK, so there are Indians who have got banking experience as well. So it's, so it's a real challenge. Um, having said that, to work as a chartered accountant um, on a consultancy basis, where you're based in India and maybe go to do projects, that is something that, that there are possibilities for. So just, um, just 
so that you know, in order to get a standard visa, which is where you can go and explore opportunities, you obviously need your passport, you need to show that you've got funds in the bank, um, you will need to show proof of earnings, so some kind of, you know, whether it's uh, your past pay slips or um, payroll or whatever, your details of your current employment, and somebody in the UK who will support you. So you will need some kind of letter of support from someone in the UK. And these are the fees that it costs to go to do that. So it is worth, um, it is worth going to explore to see if you can do consulting or something, but working and getting a job is, is almost impossible. Really the only way to do it is the way Mina will tell you, which is if you're working for an Indian company that has um, a subsidiary or has an allied organisation in the UK, you can get a secondment for a period of time. So if you join an FNC that can, that can give you that opportunity, that's the best, um, best chance. And as I said, there's something called the res Resident Labour Market Test, proving that no one in the UK could actually do that job. Otherwise, the job has to go to that person. Okay, if you get the work permit, and you want to practice as a chartered accountant, so you want to join, let's say, a mid-sized firm of accountants in the UK, then you need to be a member of ICAW, and you also need to get a practicing certificate. Uh, you can't sign an audit report in the UK unless you've had the two years UK experience, and you've got to take five examinations. That's actually not an ICAW requirement, that's a Financial Reporting Council uh, requirement, so it's a government requirement, not an ICAW requirement. So, um, so that is one of the challenges. Those of you who are thinking, can I actually audit in the UK? You'd have to be there for two years and you would have to um, work and do those five exams in order to be able to do so. Generally, if you do want to work in audit, it is advisable to have ICAW as well as ICAI. You can still do it, and there are many ICAIs who are in the UK, but as time goes on, what we found is that more employers are asking for both certifications. There is one other way to get to the UK, which is something that Arun uh, mentioned earlier, which is about entrepreneurship. If you have an idea, and many chartered accountants are now starting to work with engineers or other people who have got ideas for patents, you can both migrate to the UK and get what's known as a Tier 1 Entrepreneurship Visa. If you want to run that business in the UK, so if you want to start it up and run it, in order to do that, you've got to speak fluent English, which most of you will do because you're qualified chartered accountants. You need to show them that you've got about 45 lakh in investment funds that you're ready to spend in the country. So that effectively would pay for you to be there and to start your, your venture there. There are lots of incubation centers, accelerators, places where you can get either free, free co-working space or very, very low cost co-working space, space. But the caveat is that you must only work on this business. So you can't get an entrepreneurship visa, go to the UK with your 40 lakh and then go and apply for a job. You can't do that. It has to be working with the startup. Um, and we've seen many accountants, many accountants go with an engineer to create something over there um, and come back very, very successful. If you decide to do that, then it's a three year visa that you'll get, up to three years. So that's, that's a pretty good opportunity. Um, the other option, and that's really for those of you who are working in audit firms or have your own audit practice, the opportunities of working with the UK are massive. Bringing work to India, there are small and medium sized audit firms across the UK, I mean even though the UK is such a tiny country, across the UK there are many audit firms that are looking at outsourcing their work, outsourcing either the basic accounting or outsourcing the basic IT. And the basic is, uh, income tax returns. The basic in income tax returns in the UK are not that difficult. There are courses that you can do, whether it's through ICAW or separately, where you can get up to date, you can train a few staff, and there are opportunities for that. Um, so practicing in India but preparing the accounts or helping the process for UK companies is a big opportunity. And again, you can apply for a standard visa which allows you to go to the UK to meet some of these firms. Just to let you know, in the second half of next year, 
ICAW is looking at doing an event in London where they're going to be getting small and medium-sized firms from the UK and they're going to be inviting firms from India to participate as a big networking meet. And preceding that, we're looking at setting up a community of ICAW members here in Bangalore and in Mumbai, so a pilot group of maybe 30 to 40 companies and a pilot group from the UK of 30 to 40 where we're going to give you space on the website to communicate with each other, to talk about the kinds of clients you have, the opportunities that could be there, and to start some discussions going, so that when you go to that event in the second half of next year, there's hopefully something more concrete that will come out of it. So that's a pilot project that we're looking at starting at, at the beginning, or later this year, or at the beginning of next year, to get the firms to start communicating with each other. So there are lots and lots of opportunities there. But rather than hear from me, I think we should hear from somebody who's done it. So I would now like to invite Mina up to speak. And she's going to talk about her journey from going from ICAI to ICAW and way beyond. Thanks, Vandana. Vandana has always been inspiring. Uh, I think I know from the past four or five years now. And, and I can vouch for it. It's been an incredible journey from ICAI to uh, ICAW, working in the UK and coming back to Bangalore. Uh, before I start, let me just uh, give you some facts about the uh, ICAW's ACA examination, which is the uh, Associate Chartered Accountancy. Uh, did you all know that it's the most advanced learning and professional development programs available? I'll, I'll probably go on to explain why it is the most advanced learning exams. There are more than 1,47,000 members currently. And the most um, important and interesting part is, this is recognized in 170 plus countries in the world. How many countries do we have? 195? 170 out of 195 is almost like 87%. So it's not just you know you're going to the UK and working. Uh, you can choose any country to work once you're an ICAW member. So this gives a pretty wide uh, gamut for you to uh, uh, show your skill sets and work in various countries. Uh, so I, I did mention that uh, uh, it's the most advanced learning course. Uh, and why is it called an advanced learning course? Or, or, or why do we, uh, how is it differentiated from, from various other courses available? Um, so I think I, Vandana will take you through the more uh, uh, details of how, how you could get the membership of the institute. Uh, but if you look at the initial papers of the exam, the first level is where you write individual subjects like say accountancy, auditing, taxation, uh, law, or, uh, management study, management uh, accounting and sort like that. But when you move on to the second and the third level, uh, which is more called technical integration, technical integration and uh, um, yeah, the advanced case study. Here the papers are not uh, individual subjects, it's more of a integrated uh, case studies or you know, in the technical integration you, you have uh, two to three case studies which are more in terms of a business problem that you need to solve. So you're not just answering a question based on income tax solution or you're not calculating tax or you're not tying in a balance sheet or you're not um, tying a cash flow. What you're trying to do is Analyzing all the subjects that are available, analyzing things on a business perspective to answer that particular question. You know, building this sort of a skill set for a student um, actually helps us in uh, applying this to our day-to-day -day business. It's not that, you know, I, I, can, I can think of simple examples. Before um, I did the ICAW when I was in the beginning of my career, uh, I could never link things in a balance sheet. Uh, I would see capital advances somewhere and you know, okay, there is capital advances, someone has paid, there is a voucher and done with it. Uh, because I am in the audit field, uh, I, I have to look at the balance sheet more detail. I could never think of a situation that, oh yeah, there is a capital advance, there could be a capital commitment elsewhere. These things would never uh, think, uh, link for me. And the idea of uh, analyzing things from a more business perspective is what I learned through the ICAW exam. Uh, the next most important thing in this exam is the ethics part of uh, the syllabus is integrated in all levels. So from the uh, initial level to 
uh, technical integration to the advanced case study, everything that you think of, you need to keep in mind that there is a uh, point of ethics, there is a point of uh, how you would decide in a particular situation. Now this actually makes us a uh, uh, wonderful human being. Every time you think you have to, you, you are bound to think with ethics in your mind. Uh, it, it doesn't let that go up, uh, ever at all. Um, the next um, uh, critical thing that I thought I need to tell you all is, uh, it's actually an open book examination. So we would, we would always think, oh wow, open book, I can refer to 101 books and I can answer, I can finish it fast. But nothing comes without a time bound in, in this world. This is also time bound. Some, some of the exams are I think three and a half hours, four hours and uh, it varies with the exams. We have to be able to find the right thing in the right place and, and apply it to that particular situation to be able to get that. And a person who knows when to apply that, where to apply it and how to do it is, is bound to succeed in his examinations. Um, the, the next thing that, you know, when, when I actually uh, was told that, uh, or uh, when I thought of getting into this ICAW course, it was the initial years when ICA entered into the MOU with uh, ICAW, and we were supposed to write two levels of examination. If you had, uh, uh, if you had a letter of good standing from the institute, and I think some years of experience, um, I, I was freaked. I had freaked out. I didn't know what to do. Whether I need to take it. I have, I've already been working in a big four. Do I need to, you know, venture to some other course now and look at it? I remember this thing told by one of my partners in, uh, in my office. They said, um, look at a uh, couple of uh, big names in my firm. Most of them are ICAW members. And, and that's the reason they have grown so fast in their career. And I, I still vouch for it. I, I know a couple of uh, my seniors in, in the firm who are ICAW members. And that actually inspired me to say, let me give it a try. There's, there's no harm in uh, uh, trying to do this. Uh, we started off with, I think, uh, one week classes uh, in Mumbai. So it was actually a lot of workload. You are working in a big four, you have to uh, finish your work deadlines and still spend one week in a month in Mumbai for the classes. And this was for almost one, one and a half years because you take the exams after uh, six months, something like our uh, institute exams of ten months. I think the gap there is, uh, first one is after six months and something like that. Uh, so initially when we uh, went through the course, uh, uh, there, were, there were almost 120 people I think across India. Uh, two from Bangalore, a couple of them from Mumbai, uh, Pune, Delhi, Kolkata and all of them. And I think all of us were stunned. The initial papers, we were, we were given some mock exams and we had no idea what to answer. We, we had absolutely no idea. You know, it, it was more of a business question than you know, trying to ask us on some technical matter in IFRS or you know, asking us to do a tax computation which we were all pretty well versed with. But to provide a solution to that business issue was a real difficult task. And, and when our results came in the first mock exam, we said, I think we should just go back home. There's, there's no way we are going to do it. Um, over that period of uh, six to eight months, when you know we were trained by Vandana and her team of faculty, it was amazing. I think the exams were actually a cakewalk after that. Though uh, you know we had to spend that time learning and stuff like that. Uh, the, in, fa in fact, the advanced case study, which I'll give you an example, you get the case almost one month in advance. You know what you're going to be questioned on, or rather you know the company, or you know the entire business scenario on which you're going to be questioned on. So on the day of the exam, you get another 15 pages further to the case study, and, and then you're asked some question. So it is one whole business. You're trying to provide a solution to a business, and this needs to be done in a span of four, four and a half hours keeping in mind accounts, uh, tax, uh, and all, all the subjects, ethics and everything. Uh, the important part in this is, you know, when, when you have to provide a business solution, it's not just the particular business. You need to know about the industry. You need to know about what is happening for that, about that industry in the market. And when, when the ICAW has this case studies every six months, they pick up an industry which is uh, in question correctly. There is some news about it or there is something happening about that industry. So you know, you get accustomed to reading news, you get accustomed to trying to know things uh, in the market about this particular business or about the particular industry. Uh, I think we were questioned about some retail industry or something like that. But every, every examination is such that it will focus on something that is currently happening in the industry. And, and that's more than a technical but a professional development uh, uh, 
the examination that I would say. Um, I think after after I qualified, I, I actually moved to the UK on a, a transfer from my firm. Um, though you know we, we said that this was an easy way out. This also did have the uh, uh, labor test, or you know my firm had to do that one month of advertisement in a local newspaper, and then come up and say, uh, no, we don't have anyone in UK who satisfies the skill set, so we are getting it. But probably because I was uh, ICAW qualified chartered accountant, it was much easier for me. Because I know a couple of my colleagues recently, in fact one just three months back whose visa was rejected, rejected. she is only a chartered accountant from India and who wanted to move in the same firm like I did. But her, her uh, sponsorship was rejected. And I think that's, that's probably, uh, that was probably helpful in my case because I was a chartered accountant from UK also. <coughs> Once I moved to the UK, um, this, there's a big difference in how uh, you know, we work. Um, a lot of things are much, much, much more organized probably because it's a more developed country. Um, things like, you know, I, I used to uh, audit a retail company which is, uh, had more than 2,000 odd stores, more than 150, 200 subsidiaries. I, I don't even know the count. It was that, that large a company and they would close the books in literally seven days. The consolidated accounts, not the standalone accounts. And you know, without working a weekend or without working late in the night which is incredible. I don't see that here. We, we, we do still, uh, we, we are getting there, we are using a lot of technology and stuff to get there, but it is probably going to take some time. And I think the, the company that I was referring to did have a uh, lot of uh, chartered accountants from England and Wales. There were Indian people also working there who were qualified uh, from, from both the locations. The company also has an office in, in, in the backlog here itself. Um, the, other most uh, uh, critical thing about this course that I would say is actually it is IFRS based. You know, uh, that makes it more um, uh, value added because it is recognized in many countries across the globe. Um, once, you know, uh, after the two years of my two, two and a half years, I think I was there in the UK and I returned back to India at the same firm, uh, I, I see a huge growth in my, my uh, office. I, I can see uh, the speed at which I have grown compared to a lot of other colleagues, uh, nothing to mention about anything. But, uh, and I have also seen that with a couple of other people who qualified with me. Uh, we had a, um, a manager uh, who, was, who was working as a treasury manager in uh, HDFC. She is now the general manager at HDFC. Um, we have, yeah, I'm sorry, at Mahindra. Um, in, in fact, she featured in one of the ICAW's magazine a month or two back. There are also some of these uh, uh, initiatives by the institute there. Uh, a lot of them that interest me personally and I, I keep a track. I have, I've been a member of the institute for the past 3-4 years now. Um, they have things like, uh, one of course is the magazine which is, which is pretty interesting. You have a lot of uh, good articles to read about. You have good inspiring stories about uh, people who have uh, uh, grown from probably nothing to being an ICAW chartered accountant and being uh, heads of a lot of businesses in the UK. Uh, they also have things like the Excel community, uh, you know, which, which trains people online. You don't have to be physically in UK. You can do it from wherever. You can do it from uh, your laptops, wherever across. Uh, a lot of tips and tools, uh, seminars on uh, uh, data analytics, uh, Excel, and things like that, which, which is very helpful even now. It's not just, you know, because of being a member of the institute. It just helps personally in work, in, in everything that you're doing on a day to day basis. Um, I think overall I would say, uh, personally it's given me an extremely good uh, viewpoint, my, the way I think and I, I am able to solve issues at my workplace, I am able to handle people or uh, you know, uh, give that value add to the client. Um, I, I see a big difference from what I used before and what, what has been my journey after the uh, examination. Um, and we'll let Vandana probably take over and then we can have the question answer. Right. Thank you. So there's an, a first-hand account. I was just going to uh, go through a few things. Um, so, so how can ICAW help you? Look, I'm acutely aware that <coughs> these are large amounts of money. Well, they're, they're relatively large amounts of money. And there's one phrase I learned. I think genetically, when you're Indian, it really is in your genes, and it's basavasul, right? That's a phrase that I think is, is just in us. We want to make sure that we get our money's worth. So um, I thought it would be 
good to put a, a few bits of information up about the, the ways I, I certainly got myself a school over the years. I could never have opened, I, I opened my first business when I was 26. Um, I left Ernst & Young to open a small training company and my small training company within a year became a big training company. We went from zero students to a thousand students in one year and then I got bought out by a listed company. That happened when I was 27, sorry. Um, that I would never have been able to start that business. I would never have had the courage if I hadn't learned all the tools and the, the tricks from the Institute on thinking broadly, because for me, chartered accountancy isn't accounting and tax, it's business advice. Um, so a couple of things, the network. Uh, I think the, the network that we have, both in India and, um, and across the world is amazing. And once you're part of ICAW, you can reach out to members in any part of the world. Um, Mina will tell you maybe a bit later some of the stories, but for example, um, we had Deepak Barek who came, he's one of our members from HDFC, he came to the first ceremony after you guys passed your first set of exams. Um, we had Mr. Mulligan uh, come to one of the others. The day they finished their final exams, Ishak Hussain from the Tata Group hosted a dinner for them at uh, one of the Dutch restaurants and opened up about his life and about how his career had grown. And our members do that. Our, our members, our senior members want to give back. And we encourage our members to mentor other members. So there's a lot of mentoring available within the ICAW community, whether you're here in India or whether you're anywhere else. Sometimes the mentoring is virtual, sometimes the ment mentoring is face-to-face. -face. But ICAW is very much about you reach out and we will support. Don't expect us to spoon feed. That's not what we do. So if you have a need, contact the Institute and someone will be there to support you. So access to business opportunities, like I said, I'm really interested in hearing from firms who are interested in being part of this pilot scheme with UK firms joining Indian firms. But what I would want to hear from you is, I've got these kinds of clients and I think they could export to the UK but perhaps don't know how. That's the kind of thing I, I want to hear rather than I'm interested. So if you, if you can show us that you've got something, then we can help facilitate it. But if you just say, I'm interested, then it's very difficult for us to know how to support. Um, there are exclusive meetups in different cities. I mentioned just a, a, a few of them. Keiki's also very, very active with us. He's um, ex-CEO of Unilever India, um, ex-chairman of Sony and uh, uh, board member of Uni Unilever Global. So all of these people are available and they do do sessions. They come to Bangalore, they come to other, other cities. If you can't get to it, the event is recorded so that you can watch it. Um, knowledge. If you're really interested in a particular area, there are projects that are going on around the world with virtual communities, so you can get in touch with those. Uh, the largest online library in the world is ICAW's library. So you get access as soon as you become a member, so there's reports literally from every country, um, there's, there's other information, other things to look up, uh, pretty good facilities there. And uh, finally, we talked a little bit about all the new areas of accounting which ICAW concentrates on. So really three main areas, knowledge, support and network. Um, Mina referred to different places, these are examples of some of the places where our members work. And it is, it's quite amazing, a lot of people don't, don't believe me when I say this, but honestly the average salary of an ICAW across the world is 1CR, Indian 1CR, right, average salary. Because, but of course they have to work pretty hard for that, um, but, 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 but they're expected to be of that level. And so that's the average salary across the world, different places it's higher, lower. So how do you become a member? Just very briefly, I want to talk about that. How many of you have got less than five years of experience? Can you just put your hand up? Okay, those of you who have got less than five years of experience, you have to do the exam route, and that's what Mina just spoke about, so I'll go through that briefly. If you've got more than five years of experience, there is a new route that is available to you. Poor Mina wasn't allowed to do this because we didn't have it in existence, and you don't have to write exams. You have to do a personal examination, which you send to them, and I'll explain what that is. It's what we call the experience route. So first of all, looking at 
the exam route. So if you've got less than five years of experience, the top three papers are the papers that you need to do. So it's a corporate reporting paper, a strategic business management paper, and a case study. And, and just to go on with what Mina said, basically your client never comes to you and says, what's the tax implications, but I don't want to know how the accounting is going to be affected. They want to know everything. Yeah? So ICAW prepares you to be able to say, listen, if you do this for tax purposes, then in your accounts it's going to look like this, which is going to lower your profit for the year, which might impact um, your debt covenants with the bank. That is how an ICAW would look at it. You can't look at anything in isolation. So none of the exams are in isolation at the highest level. They are all combined. Um, and that's, that's the way we get our mem members to think. So, for example, I'm not going to go through this in detail. For corporate reporting, you know, is an accounting, uh, uh, sorry, is a financial reporting treatment appropriate? You can argue yes or no, but it's about your justification. So, even in the marking grid, it won't say um, you have to say yes. It will say it depends, and you will get marks for your justification. Now, obviously, there will be some particular places where you have to, by law, do something. But in the rest of it, they really want to see how you're applying your knowledge to a particular situation. Evaluating and applying technical knowledge, evaluating corporate reporting policies or estimates, identifying and explaining ethical issues. That's what's covered in the corporate reporting paper. So that one is very backward-looking at financial reports. The forward-looking paper is strategic business management. And that's evaluating the consequence of a strategic choice. Should we open a factory or should we buy someone else? You know, that would be a standard one. <coughs> With lots of information about competitors, about standards, etc., etc. Which of the choices? Identify and advise about appropriate finance requirements. Should we go to a bank and get money or should we raise money from investors? If we're going to raise money from investors, should we go for VC or should we go for angel? What's my justification for each of those? Um, and always, even if you have to give three choices, you will always, always have to say, and my choice is X, at the end of it. They don't want you sitting on a fence. They want to know that you're ready to make a decision if you need to. Interpreting and applying corporate reporting information in evaluating business and financial performance. So looking at things like intangible assets, looking at things like tangible assets, and basically saying, is the return on capital employed justifiable? Is it likely to continue or is it not? What should they be doing to alter the situation? Um, I think Mina quite you know, explained the case study, so I won't, um, I won't go through that in detail. So this gives you an idea of the skills that you'll learn. Um, a lot of people say it's like doing a mini MBA. And it really is. Those final three papers are, are like doing an MBA. And I have to be honest with you, it will cost like an MBA as well. It's going to cost you about 1.5 lakh to do those three exams. So those of you who are maybe four years of experience, you might want to wait one year and go for the other approach, which is, which is slightly cheaper. Um, so to give you an idea of the investment that you would need in this room, although, you know, honestly, what you learn in it is going to stay with you for life, it is expensive, so sorry, it's not one lakh, it's about two and a half lakhs in total. Um, when you register, it's about one lakh. Each time, or when you take the case study, it's about 45,000. Just the books are about 27,000 rupees for the three papers, and that doesn't include the tuition. Now, the challenge is, in India, the tuition is no longer available face-to-face. -face. It's only available online, and there are many providers that offer it online. There are approved providers, but I can honestly tell you, I've been through some of those courses, they, they are brilliant, and they still answer your questions. So you can still email them, you can still phone them up and say, I don't understand this, can you explain it to me? And they will do that as part of your package. It does require dedication and commitment. I would say, um, let's say we're in um, October now, it's too late for you guys to do the November, December exams, so the next exams would be in June, July. If you started studying now, you'd need to give it five hours a week. If you start studying in, let's say, February, March, you would need to give it about 10 to 11 hours a week. 
Um, you, can, you can honestly say, no, no, I can get away with less than that. But this isn't a bookish exam. You have to practice and practice and practice. And I think the hardest thing is, how many of you write with your hands? Not many of us anymore. Okay, one person. Um, not many of us anymore. We're most, mostly used to typing. The exams at the moment are pen and paper. Within the next year, they're converting to online, but at the moment, they're pen and paper. So getting your thought process together, being able to write that answer in that amount of time is quite tough. So you've got to get into practice with all of those things. 75% um, pass in the UK. That's the pass rate. First time passes. 30% in India, only because people don't give enough time. And I know the challenge, and Nina will tell you, we can do this in the Q&A. It is very hard when you're holding down a full-time job. She said to you, in, in the UK, nobody works weekends. And most people finish work at six. So you have a few hours you can study. I don't think you probably remember the last time you finished at six o'clock and didn't work at the weekend. So I know what it's like here. So you have to be extra committed if you want to go the exam route. <laughs> Now, if you want to go the experience route, it's much, much easier. Currently, if you're qualified ICAI, if you are up to date with all your CPD and you can get a letter of good standing, you can apply this way, right? So you need to have five years, at least five years, of full membership. When it says membership gained by normal education and training, what, what it means is you can't be a member of, let's say, Institute of Sri Lanka and do a reciprocal membership with India and then apply through that reciprocal membership to the UK. That doesn't count here. So you've gained it by normal standards. You've got to have a good disciplinary record, compliant with CPD. You need to have a sponsor. A sponsor isn't somebody who has to pay anything. They don't have to pay anything. But they need to be somebody who knows you and is willing to go through your application and sign off that you indeed have done it and you haven't copied it from anywhere. That's all. And they can be a member of the Indian Institute, or they can be an ICAW member, whichever. Okay, who is this for? Sorry, I've done that one. What do you have to do to apply? The first thing you have to do is complete an application form. Get your letter of good standing. Find your sponsor. As I said, they've got to read through it. You've got to answer questions in something called an examination of experience. And there's a template that's given to you. And you need to pay £260, which is about, uh, my maths is going here, 25,000? About 25,000 rupees, which will be payable in December when you submit everything. So um, I'm going to skip the letter of good standing because I think you know what that is. You can apply for it online. Do you know what it is? Yeah. So just very briefly, you write to ICAI online and you ask for a letter of good standing and they send you a letter which says that you're a member of ICAI, you're fully qualified, you have a good disciplinary record, and there's no reason why they can't think you should apply for ICAW. That's all it is, yeah? Um, it's more of a challenge for those in industry who maybe haven't kept up with CPD requirements. But if you're in practice, the chances are you, you won't have any issue whatsoever. The sponsor must know you, they must be qualified, um, ICAI or from another body. Um, they need to have a good disciplinary record. They also need to get a letter of good standing, which needs to be submitted. I'm happy to share these slides, by the way, um, rather than you taking notes, it's up to you. Um, and you have to submit this in a window of time. It's, it, I think it opens now on the 14th of December, and it's until the 15th of February. I think actually that date has been brought back to the 31st of January. So you have to upload all these documents on the internet. Um, so you need about half an hour um, to upload everything. And it's then assessed, your examination of experience is assessed, and I'll just come on to that in a minute. Um, once it's been assessed and you have been given ICAW membership, you then have to pay for that membership. And that's about 60,000. Now, I just found out last week, you are the first group to know about this, is that they've just reduced the price for people from um, certain countries, and India is one of them. So it's now gone down to about 35,000 uh, rupees that you have to pay as an initial joining fee, which includes the annual fee. So the first fee will be about 35,000. 
Okay, the examination of experience. There are two things that you have to submit. The first part is you have to answer certain questions, right? And I'll show you the questions that you have to answer. They're not complex, but the way you answer them is very, very specific. And the second part is you have to give a summary of your employment. Okay, so what are the questions? Now, you saw everything that was asked from those final three papers. This is almost like doing a case study on your own life. So here are the questions. In total, your answer shouldn't be more than 6,000 words. So it's about 500 to 750 words per, per question. And you've got to get between 55 and 60%, right? So you've got to pass each question at least by 50%. The questions that you have to answer are as follows. Using your recent work experience, describe how you identified two different business or technical financial issues. So it's not rocket science, right? You can pick any two different business issues. And on the website, there are actual examples that you can read to get an idea. So the example on the website is about how um, somebody noticed from looking at the financial statements that debtors seem to be understated from one year to the next. And the issue is how you identified, not how you solved it. How did you identify it? What calculations did you do to realize there was a difference? What was the first thought process that made you think this doesn't look right? That's what they want to know about. Anyone can solve a problem, but the question is, can you identify it, okay? So that's the first question. How do you identify two different business and or technical financial issues? The second question is, how have you used technical expertise or business knowledge to analyze a business or a professional situation? So it could be that you were, um, you know, a, a client came to you and said, look, I need to get a loan and I'm not sure if my financial statements look okay. So it could be how you used your knowledge to decide whether that person should or should not go for a loan or if there were some other opportunities. The third question, using your recent work experience, demonstrate how you've used numerical techniques to analyze a business or professional situation. So you can talk about analytical review, you can talk about data days, you can talk about anything um, or more complex things. How you've used professional judgment in choosing between options and two situations where you've used your technical or practical experience to develop advice. So it isn't that difficult, but what they want you to do is to really think about how you've done it, not the solution. So there's advice, you know, so for example, the very first one, describe your approach, explain your processes, Focus on how you identified the issues rather than the outcome of the identification. Now, what I'm allowed to do as the advisor for India is look at your answers and give you some coaching. So I can't tell you how to rewrite it, but I can say to you, have you explained sufficiently how you've done it, or what were the parameters, and have you answered those parameters? I've just been reviewing some questions. And the major challenge that I've had is people have told me what they've done. They've said, oh, I identified there was a problem with debtor days. And what I did was I told the client that they needed to do X, Y, and Z. And so I went back to them and I said, did, how did you identify? Tell me the process you went through. And then they said, oh, I did this, then this, then this. And I said, that's what you need to be writing, not what you've written. So there is some guidance that I can give you like I said, I'm not the examiner, but I am authorized by ICAW to look at them and give you a bit of coaching around it. Um, and there's lots and lots of information on the website, um, icaw.com stroke pathways. There's the application form, the template, there's guidance from examiners, and a sample of examination of experience um, scripts. 70% uh, of people who apply actually pass in this group, just so that you know. So from my point of view, that's all we wanted to cover, but we're really, you know, we're here for you to answer any questions. So I'm just going to take a seat over here and really just be here. We're here to answer any questions. So we'll start the ball rolling.
Any questions for Mina, Arun, or myself? Yeah, please. So, uh, if uh, there is a shortage in CPD and you have five years or more of professional experience, can you take the other route? If, if um, there's a shortage of CPD, then um, yeah. yes, yes, you can. You can take the examination route. So you still have to write only the three papers. You'll have to write the three papers, and you need to be, you need to have your three years of articleship. That's it. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so you still get exemption for your first two levels of. You still get the exemption for the first two levels. However, where you may have a problem mm -hmm. is even for the writing the three papers, mm -hmm. you have to get. Um, a letter of good standing. And to get a letter of good standing, you need to be compliant in CPD. Yeah. So, so you might not make it for December, but there are two windows you can apply for the examination of experience. Mm -hmm. um, it will be December, January, and then it will be open again in July next year. Mm -hmm. um, I have somebody in Delhi at the moment who is in a similar position, mm -hmm. but she's she strategically worked out that she can do enough events between now and December to get her CPD back up, and she's then going to apply for the letter of good standing in December. Okay. And uh, there's another thing where uh, you did just mention so that can you, can you just, yeah. Yeah. Uh, this uh, course is with this degree or professional degree is recognized in about 130 countries. Uh, so, is there still a challenge in terms of uh, different laws in different countries, and then how does this recognition still help you? So, um, you're absolutely right, every country is different. Now, if you want to practice as an auditor in those countries, whichever country you go to, you will have to take a test of the accounting, um, sorry, of the tax and the law. Um, but, but aside from that, what it helps you, it's just more recognised. It's like if you, if you go to a firm and, you're, and you say in that country, I'm ICAI and ICAW, they're more likely to take you because they've heard of ICAW. Uh, so it's more from a job opportunity point? Yes. Okay. I and uh, uh, I also heard that uh, you, know, you have to look, take a holistic view on any particular transaction. Like you just can't give your advice on tax. Like you know, when you, yeah. uh, did, you, take, you took an example of uh, capital advances. So you may just have to look at holistically what impact would it have in tax and all. So uh, is there uh, no specialization in terms of tax and audit and reporting? In terms of the examination, it is not a specialized examination. You have to learn everything. Yeah, no, uh, as a professional as, practice. As a professional, it depends on which industry you are working with. Working <coughs> for example, in the firm that I work, mm -hmm. we do have industry specialization. And, okay. and now, uh, in the UK, a lot of the audit firms go with industry specialization, like say, uh, technology, uh, financial sector, banking sector, and stuff like that. But for the exam, we do need to learn everything. No, no, my question is on uh, in professional. Uh, yes, in professional, you, you can uh, choose to uh, have a specialization in any industry. So it's not uh, practice area wise, but it's more from an uh, industry. Yes, it's more from an industry for which you, you support, not okay. from practice. Practice, also, there are people who, who would practice only for taxation, only for uh, audits or accounting and uh, things like that, which is similar to what we have in India. Okay. And, uh, so, can we can we ask if you get a few more and then we'll come back sure, to you? Sure. Yeah. Other questions? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I just wanted to know: uh, Is there any uh, particular definition of uh, experience when you say five years? Because uh, post qualification, uh, for the first two years I was with uh, a PwC and then with a startup, and now I have my own practice. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. They want to know that you've done your full three years articleship, and then, um, and then you've you've done other things. Post qualification, it could be anything. Post qualification, you could do anything. Okay. Yeah. So for these small and medium enterprises, see, is which, for example, we do not have entities which would, I was just hoping which should they want to enter the UK or the other way around. So is there any forum you can suggest where we can connect with the CAs in maintaining small, small time CAs So, So, um, what would the purpose be? To collaborate. In what sense? Uh, so maybe our clients who might 
further on go there and they want to do something here. It's good out Sure, um, and that's what I was saying. I think uh, what ICAW is, one of the things that the exams teach you is that there's got to be a focus. So to say collaborate is fine, but if you could come up with, you know, I'm a small firm and these are my kinds of clients, I am looking for X, Y and Z, then it would be possible. If it was just generally to meet, I, I think ICAW wouldn't be that interested in necessarily facilitating it because they want to see businesses grow. Right, so uh, another yeah. forum, apart from this, maybe where we choose uh, EAS from India and UK can kind of uh, have a forum where they can uh, share the business and all that. Can you, can you think, you know, where small firms can collaborate? Because um, I know it wouldn't be UK IBC. Um, and I don't think it would be high commission. Yeah, yeah, actually there is an organisation here in Bangalore, it's not massively active, but there is an organisation called the British <coughs> Business Group, British Business Group in Bangalore, and they tend to be much, much smaller organisations that kind of get together for networking. <coughs> so um, that's one, you know, afterwards I'm happy to share my card, and I can, uh, I do know the guy who runs it, so you can perhaps talk to him. Yeah? Uh, you said that uh, 45 lakhs is what is required for setting up a, uh, for getting a visa over there, right? So, sorry, say that again. 45 lakhs is what is required yes. for getting a visa, business visa. Right? Entrepreneur visa. Yeah, entrepreneur visa. So, is it like a person wise, or say for example, I am setting up a partnership firm, but in two or three partners will be there. Can we have a capital commitment of 45 lakhs at one shot, or is it like 45 lakhs per person? Um, are you talking about setting up a, an accountancy firm? Or, yes. Uh, so you can't use the entrepreneur's visa for that. The, uh, the entrepreneur's visa is really, the aim is to get you to go to the UK as a startup and take advantage of what Aaron said, which is like, you know, the patent, etc. Now, if you want to set up um, account, an accountancy firm, uh, you wouldn't come under employment you come under being an investor, and, and there's a different way of doing it. So I, I you know, uh, I don't know the rules off by heart about that, but it wouldn't come under entrepreneurship. I think you would go over on a standard visa. You could then open a company, and then you can consult for that for that company. Yeah. I think we've got we've got a couple over here. Thank you. I am Ravi Ika. I am a practicing tax accountant. And uh, looking at the opportunities in UK, <coughs> the kind of opportunities practical CS in Bangalore can look up to is where the outsourcing. Like few people ask, how can we get connected to people in UK? Because we are good at uh, bookkeeping, tax sure. corporates. We also understand the uh, IFRS. So I, I mentioned that in the presentation. I'm not sure if you heard, I but think, yeah. uh, but basically. Um, that's one area that we're looking at and we're looking at doing an event next year, second half of next year and I'm looking for pilot organisations that would be interested, small and medium sized um, audit firms here who would be interested in linking up with small and medium sized audit firms in the UK to look at some possible collaboration. Yeah. So we can speak about that. I think you it's the same one? Okay. Good evening, I'm Sivala Rajan. I'm working as an employee in a multinational company. Suppose uh, if I want to find a job in UK, I need to become a member of uh, the ICIM. That is, uh, with, with, uh, once we become the member of ICIM, uh, do we need to physically move to UK to find a job or we can start looking for employment? That, that's what I was saying. It's a real difficulty. Uh, the point is, you can't move to the UK. Um, at all without an employment visa and you can only get an employment visa if you get an offer from an employer so you can go on a standard visa to the UK to talk to people to try to look for a job but the big problem in the UK is as it stands at the moment it's extremely difficult to get a job as a chartered accountant even if you're ICAW from India because they will they'll do what a, let, let me know, answer that. Just to, just to add to that, 
the employer who is going to sponsor you also has to pay a huge fees to the consulate. So, and, and they need to wait for a time period of I think one and a half to two months because you have a deadline every month to submit that uh, uh, residential status thing uh, with the uh, uh, consulate and then advertise in the newspaper for one month and then get you on a sponsorship. So it's almost a span of easily two months and they need to pay a huge amount to the consulate. So it's, it's very difficult to get that, get a company to sponsor for you and they can find someone there locally. So you will have to prove that, you know, until unless you are going from the same organization that you are working for. Yeah. Uh, like I said, things may be very different after Brexit. We believe, we believe that there's going to be some kind of new scheme, but it hasn't been officially announced yet. We think, we think things may be easier next year after April. Thank you. I would like to know your opinion about CPI route because as far as I know, uh, the examination for a qualified CA, it's only objective examination and um, I think maybe it is much more simpler when compared to ICEW, but what is the scope of doing this course? No. Uh, so, so I don't know that much, right, about the Irish Institute. I know that they're mm -hmm. as good as the UK Institute. But um, I guess the difference is ICAW has a much bigger global reach than ICAI, um, ICAI Institute of Chartered Accountants of Ireland. Um, so that's one thing I'd say. Um, second thing is, if you've got more than five years of experience, honestly, I think actually writing the examination of experience isn't a massive challenge. Uh, but I would say there are opportunities in Ireland, but Ireland is part of the EU as well, so getting there and getting a job is, is going to be a challenge. Okay. Uh, so in continuation with earlier question that the sir asked, so even if we clear the examination and become the member, so how do we approach? So is there any campus placement type uh, uh, thing which is organized over there? So how do we approach the company with, uh, without going over there? Uh, I, I want to make it very clear that no, there is no campus placement. Um, the way it's always worked is people have either been seconded, like Mina was. Um, that, that's really, in the last couple of years, that's been the only way. Prior to that, there was something called the HSMB, which was the Highly Skilled Migrant Program, which is what we think is going to come back in. Um, in which case, then you go to the UK, and ICAW has um, a job portal where you can you can basically apply, but there isn't like campus placement like like it's done over here. Mm. Any other questions? Yeah, just one last question. Uh, so you're referring to the the meeting in the next year, right? The partners are going to firm to meet. So is. Uh, uh, Becoming a member of uh, ICAW, a prerequisite for to be yeah. part. Yeah, it would be because um, ICAW members will <coughs> want to. It's easier for them to work with ICAW member firms, right. not because they don't trust ICAI, but you need to think about it in terms of the companies over in the UK. The companies in, over in the UK understand ICAW; they don't understand ICAI. So if their, their auditor or their advisor says to them, there's an ICAW equivalent in India, there's just a lot more trust straight away. Oh, oh. Yeah. So if we are uh, opting for the experience route, uh, will IFRS be part of the curriculum? Like, since it is not covered uh, under ICAI syllabus? <coughs> um, so, if you're going the examination route, um, the, the exam has IFRS in it. If you're going through the examination of experience, then there are many, many resources on the website that can get you up to date on IFRS. Um, the new ICAI syllabus, though, does have I, um, IFRS in it. So, there's a global reporting elective. I'm on my fourth year of post qualification. As you said, if, if you're on the fourth year, it's better to wait for a year and then. <laughs> it's not better, you just might feel it's. But the root of thing for knowledge wise and practical oh. thing, the exam, which is the more better thing? Uh, you know, honestly, 
I, hands down, I would say that the examination approach is better. Having said that, I just want to tell you a little story because this is, this is, uh, you, I think you've heard this story, but Ishaq Hussain, who we talked about earlier, um, he qualified in the UK as a chartered accountant, right? And then he moved back to India and he was part of uh, another steel company that got taken over by Tata Steel. And he was sent to Jamshedpur, right, to, to live and work there as the chief accounting officer. And because at that time, this is in the 70s, there was nothing to do in Jamshedpur in the evenings. He had brought over all his ICAW books, right? So in the evenings, for fun, he decided he was going to reread all his textbooks. And he did. And literally four months after that, the finance director of Tata Steel had a heart attack and didn't pass away but had to be relieved from his duties because he wasn't in a fit state to work and they were looking for somebody to take over. Even though Ishak was like three levels down from being a finance director, because his knowledge was so up to date, when he went for the interview, he blew everyone away and he got the job. So I'm, I'm totally with you. You know, I would say, even if you decide to do the examination of experience group, I would strongly suggest get the books and, and, and read the books and try the questions because what it will give you in thought process is what's going to stay with you for your life. We do some of that by, you know, honestly, the coaching that I do for the examination of experience gets your thought process started in that way, but obviously can't do what Mina got or what I got from doing the exams. So I'm, you know, old-fashioned, I would say, it's a good idea to do the exams, but I know we live in the hare and the tortoise world and everyone wants to be the hare. Any, any other questions? Do you have any other questions? Yeah, I yes. just want to uh, check with you on uh, how different this is going to be from the qualification of AC and CK. Um, okay, I've taught both actually, so I can tell you. I would say up to the mid-level, ACCA and ICAW are just the same. But those final three papers of ICAW are far more analytical and far more um, robust in integrating your knowledge than ACCA and it's because of that that ICAW is considered a stronger qualification. At the back. Yeah, I just want to ask one thing. For being a tax professional, how difficult or easy it for us to go there and explore the opportunities? Means, for being a specific for tax professional, what kind of opportunities can this be for? I would say actually the Indian taxation rules is much more difficult than the UK tax. It's, the UK tax though has a lot of uh, things like um, our uh, house property or uh, business profession salary tax. They do have certain uh, three, four items like that. Uh, and they do have more of uh, uh, tax uh, computation and tax uh, workings for uh, companies than for individuals. But it's much simpler. I think doing the course, learning about the tax, uh, you definitely have uh, opportunities there. In terms of, you know, they also do need to file an annual return, uh, companies do need to file an annual return, though there is nothing like a tax audit that we have here. Uh, they do have a, um, annual reporting that they do and also submit the return online with uh, regular tax computations. Even for individuals, there is a tax filing every year, um, which is similar to our uh, filing. In terms of indirect taxes, um, they do have that, which is um, similar, to, something similar to what we have uh, with the three rates, zero percent, two and a half, and fourteen percent, something like that, uh, which is which is to some extent similar to what we have here. Uh, the tax computations would be a little different, and the tax workings for companies is more of uh, or would be a better scope <coughs> than the individuals. I just want to um, ask Aaron a couple of questions. So Aaron, wait, you know in Bangalore, what kinds of UK companies have you seen coming in? Which, which particular industries and uh, what size of company? Just to give, especially the practicing child accountants, an idea. Uh, 
Sure. So, um, what we've seen over the last uh, I don't know, two or three years um, in Bangalore is you've seen a bunch of technology companies come down from UK. Um, in fact, uh, we've got companies like Comsize, Enterprise Bot, a couple of others. So, these are all largely mid sized tech companies, uh, maybe about 100 to 200, 250 employees uh, in total. Revenues of between, let's say, 15 to 100 million pounds uh, annually. Uh, product companies largely, not, not services. Um, but that's on the tech side. We also have a lot of movement that's happening on the advanced engineering side. So, I don't know how, um, I don't know how much you are aware of the UK advanced manufacturing sector. That happens to actually be one of the largest uh, sectors for UK. Rolls Royce is kind of a flag bearer in that, uh, in that sector. Um, Rolls Royce by itself has been expanding hugely in India. Um, they have a joint venture with HAL here, which manufactures uh, certain parts for aircrafts. They also have um, another uh, division of theirs which does a lot of um, innovation and uh, tech for Rolls Royce globally from uh, I think Manita Tech Park uh, in, in Bangalore. Uh, that team has grown from zero to about 600 in about a year and a year and a half. Um, so, uh, and there are also other advanced manufacturing companies that are coming in. So, these will typically be component companies, you know, supplying some part of um, an aerospace component to either uh, Airbus or a Rolls Royce or a Boeing or uh, any of these guys. Um, also, there are some auto ancillary companies, again part of the advanced manufacturing uh, gambit. So, these are, these are largely the sectors in which companies come in. See, while UK is a financial services powerhouse, um, I think the entry of all those companies has already happened. Because, I mean, those companies would typically be largely banking or insurance companies. Uh, most of whom are already here. Bupa is here, Aviva is here, you know, uh, HSBC, Standard Chartered, RBS, everybody is here. So, uh, there is not much of that. There is um, a decent interest in the retail sector. So, that is, in fact, that is one of the projects that uh, UK IBC has taken on from the uh, UK government's department uh, for international trade where we have been mandated to curate a lot more retail companies from the UK to help them come and set up in, uh, in India. And uh, Bangalore obviously um, is a very interesting area for these companies, predominantly because of the fact that Amazon and Flipkart are here. So, um, uh, you know, while these are e-commerce companies and obviously everything is best done, I mean, most easily done online, but uh, I think it's just nice to be in the same city that these companies are in because uh, again for companies coming in from overseas if they want to try and get some information, they want to meet somebody from the third on Amazon, the teams are right here. So I would say, you know, technology, advanced manufacturing and retail. Okay, thanks. Any, any other questions? Okay, from our side, um, we are finished with what we wanted to say. This is typical British efficiency. I think that we thought it would take until 8.30, but we seem to have got through everything. I, I hope it's been a useful session. We are going to stay around so that you can have a chat with us, um, and we look forward to hearing from you. If any of you are interested in doing ICAW, then please come and talk to me. Give me your name, give me your phone number, your email address and I'll be in touch with you uh, tomorrow to talk about how the process works. But thank you. Thank you, uh, Vandana, Meena and uh, Arun for uh, giving us all wonderful and valuable insights into what it is to look forward to if, uh, if I decide to go and work in the UK, either as a practicing professional or as a chartered accountant working in the industry. A huge round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, to all of these speakers here today. They have taken their time to share their thoughts, their knowledge and I am sure uh, Vandana is available on the email ID that she has uh, uh, put on the slide over there. In case there are any further queries, that is one way to reach out to her and of course now 
we have uh, refreshments arranged in the canopy. We can still meet yeah. the uh, speakers one on one, face to face, and maybe we can have some time. Thank you. A round of applause once again to all the speakers. And can I request uh, CA Ravi to kindly come forward and present Memento as a token of appreciation to CA Meena? Thank you, ladies.